Hi, everybody. I'm Kevin. Um, give me just a moment to get back in my computer, and we'll get the show on the road. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Project Loon. I've had a couple questions already about where this picture was taken. So if you're curious, this is the Southern Alps in New Zealand um, with a, a Loon flight vehicle that is just taken off. Uh, you can tell it's not all the way at float yet. They fly quite a bit higher than this normally. Um, and the balloon starts to fill out. So it looks like a teardrop shortly after launch and a pumpkin once it, once it gets all the way up into the stratosphere. Um, We'll talk more about that in a bit, but let's back up a little bit first and talk about why Loon. So as Kay said, X is trying to challenge a lot of moonshots, like super big, hard, challenging problems around the world. Um, the one that Loon is trying to tackle is the fact that there are billions of people that don't have uh, reliable or any access to the internet. Um, here, that doesn't sound like such a bad thing. People take retreats to get away from their cell phone and notifications and text messages and so on. Um, but it's actually a big problem elsewhere in the world. Um, there's a lot of people that live outside of internet coverage altogether. There's billions more that have it unreliably or have to climb a tree in Africa you know, and hold the phone out. We used to walk around like this and say, can you hear me now? Um, in South America and Africa, people are still climbing three or four stories up in trees to try to send an email or a text message. So. We're trying to set out um, and figure out what can we do to bring those people back online. There are a lot of benefits to doing that. Um, there's a few listed here. Um, you can imagine if you were a farmer trying to increase your crop yields and you had access to the farmer's almanac, um, if you had an illness and could access WebMD, there's you know, a million reasons why you could want to use the internet, but certainly it has revolutionized the developed world and we're trying to bring it to people that don't have access to it. All right, so what we're trying to do essentially is shown here in a little infographic. So we're going to the sky um, with a network of stratospheric balloons trying to bring internet connectivity to rural and remote areas worldwide. So there's a little picture um, showing like how tall Mount Everest would be, um, a commercial aviation plane flying through at about 30,000 feet, and then we fly it up at 20 kilometers, so about twice as high as your commercial jet, um, but only about 10% of the way to where a satellite would be in uh, geostationary orbit. In essence, we're trying to do three things. We're trying to navigate and, and guide our balloons really precisely. Um, we don't have a tether. I get questioned a lot, like how long of a kite string do you need to hold this thing in place? We don't hold them in place. We just let them blow around in the wind. Um, the reason to do it in the stratosphere, though, is the winds are really stratified in the stratosphere. So at, say, 20 kilometers, the wind might be blowing north. At 19 kilometers, it might be blowing west. At 18 kilometers, it could be blowing south. And so as we go up and down, we're able to steer the balloon where we want it to go, just letting the wind propel us there. It means we don't need to use um, precious energy, whether you know, flying fuel or powering a motor um, to steer and, and propel and guide us. We let the wind do all the work and just try to put ourselves in the right place. Um, there's, we'll talk about that more later. That's actually one of the parts of the project that I've worked on the most um, over the, the past three and a half years, roughly. So once we are guiding them precisely, hopefully. Um, what we want to do is cluster them in teams. And so we put a cluster of balloons over an area, um, and then we want to provide prolonged periods of coverage. So any particular balloon might not be overhead for more than a couple hours or a couple days, but if we have 10 balloons in a region, you wouldn't experience any drop in connectivity even as they kind of blow around um, with the prevailing winds. The last part, obviously, is once we're in place, what do we do? And so we're trying to provide LTE con connectivity directly. When we first started the project, the idea was to put a, like, something like a MiFi, a little antenna router device that you could put on the roof of your house or hut or whatever, and we would connect to that, and then that would be your connection. We're actually now able to connect directly to your pocket. Um, so we'll talk more at the end of the presentation. Um, I'm sure you'll have lots of questions about that. I'm a mechanical engineer, as a reminder, so there's a lot of things that are just kind of like black magic to me um, in the RF world, um, but I, I'll do my best to answer your questions. I'm going to show a little video now, and um, we're going to pop out the presentation and see a bit from YouTube. Um, it's a, a fun way to see how Loon really works. While many of us take the internet for granted, large parts of the world are still unconnected. In big towns and cities, providing connectivity with cell towers is economical, as there are lots of people there wanting to connect. But the further away from these towns and cities you go, the fewer people there are, until eventually, connectivity just stops. To bring the internet to people in these areas, we need to look up, way up, into the stratosphere. From here, we can provide connectivity across much larger areas, bringing the benefits of the internet to more people. 
So how do we get there? With balloons. Really big balloons. Beginning their journey from one of our custom-built balloon launchers, our balloons are filled with lighter-than-air gas and released up into the skies. Rising 20 kilometers into the stratosphere, loon balloons float twice as high as airplanes, well above weather and wildlife. To get to where they need to go, loon balloons sail the wind by moving up or down into different wind currents traveling in different directions, joining other balloons in small teams over areas where connectivity is needed. Ground stations connected to local internet service providers send signal up to the balloons and then back down to the ground over large distances, allowing people to connect directly to the internet with an LTE mobile phone. When it is eventually time for our balloons to come down, we navigate them to remote areas and work with local air traffic control to manage their slow descent down to Earth, where they're collected by our recovery teams. By repeating this process at scale, we hope to provide continued connectivity to users on the ground, bringing the internet to more people in more places around the world. All right, it's pretty easy in cartoon form. Um, jumping back into the presentation here. So, as you saw before, like, Really what we're trying to do is connect remote users. We would never want to station one of these over the peninsula here in, in Silicon Valley, right? There's a ton of people. It makes a lot of sense to build a, a whole bunch of cell towers. Um, out in the country, though, um, it's, it's super powerful to connect all these kind of people. Um, we can put one ground station connected to a balloon, connect a bunch of other balloons to that balloon, and, and kind of jump along with a mesh network in the sky and connect people over a huge area um, all the way back to that one ground station. Again, we're really targeting people in rural areas, so any particular balloon um, covers about a 40 kilometer radius, and so we use the 700 megahertz LTE spectrum. Again, I'm a mechanical engineer, um, so not too many questions about that, but we, we use the 700 megahertz LTE spectrum to cover in a 40 kilometer radius on the ground. So everyone underneath that one balloon in an 80 kilometer circle theoretically would have access to the internet via our balloon. When we first started, I mentioned we were going to use a, a, a MiFi, and what that could have allowed you to do is if you went and bought like a Loon device, you could have connected directly to the network. What we've transitioned to and what allows us to go directly to the, the cell phone or, or device in your pocket is partnering with local telcos. And we'll talk more at the end of the presentation um, about some of the benefits of that that we saw in the aftermath of all the natural disasters last year. All right, so enough of cartoons. This is the actual CAD of our uh, flight system. So you can see the balloon is really big. Um, those things are about 45 feet across and getting bigger. Um, so if you've been, for the few of you like Kay who have been to Google X, um, now called X, we have a huge atrium that used to be the three-story atrium of the Mayfield Mall. We actually cannot inflate one of these balloons even in that giant atrium. So we have to make many ones that fill up this massive space. Um, it's able to lift a, a very large flight vehicle underneath. So you can see there's a a long pole that comes down. Uh, we call that the down connect. That's the structural link between the balloon that's really just our, our path to the stratosphere and then everything beneath. Under, so on the flight vehicle, we have a series of solar panels. So we're entirely electrically op, uh, operated and powered. So we have a, a bunch of battery packs that I designed. We charge those during the day and then deplete them during the night uh, on a daily basis for the duration of the flight. So we don't use any hydrocarbons. There's no like gas powered motors or anything like that. Um, the solar panels charge the batteries. The batteries then power every single thing else. And so we have a whole series of radios. The, uh, the comic we looked at a few minutes ago showed essentially taking a cell tower and growing it up to the 20 kilometer, 60,000 foot height. We don't do that, obviously, but we have all that functionality. Um, so we've basically designed our own cell tower that flies along on our flight vehicle, powered by those solar panels and batteries, and then a bunch of other hardware that is you know, antennas to talk to your pocket and antennas to talk to, you, to a ground station. There's the parachute shown in green. You probably can't see very well. There's a little parachute right here. That's how we bring it back down safely. Um, this is the whole flight system. The part that I, I like the most, I mentioned I worked on steering. So in the very center of the bottom of the balloon, right there is what I call the altitude control system. And that's the, it's basically a turbo machine, not unlike a turbocharger in your car um, that we used to, to, to steer and guide and, and navigate the balloon. 
Um, all right, so I'm going to cover a little bit of Loon history. It's kind of helpful to see where Loon has been, and it informs a bit about where we are and where we're going. So Loon debuted publicly to the world in 2013. It started a few years before that, actually. Um, Larry and Sergey, the, the Google co-founders, really wanted to bring the internet to the world. They obviously believe a lot in the power of the internet. They you know, started Google and wanted to organize the world's information, and they've seen it transform a lot of things. So they worked on it for a couple of years. It actually started in the early days of Android. Android was doing some uh, marketing stunts where they would fly a little Android guy on a weather balloon up into the stratosphere. And they were like, you know, what if we stuck a router on that as well? And so they went down to Safeway and bought a styrofoam cooler to keep it warm enough, tucked a router inside, and launched it on a little weather balloon along with the Android guy. There's this amazing photo of, you know, you can see the curvature of the Earth because you're at 60,000 feet. There's a little Android guy, and underneath him, there's a router. And they actually were able to, on that very first flight even, stay connected all the way up to, you know, 60,000 feet or, or whatever. And they were like, we didn't actually think that would work. We should try this a little more. Um, and that's really common with the way that X works. And so there's a process at X called rapid evaluation where they basically take what they think are really great ideas and try to kill them as fast as they can. And they just hammer on them and try to figure out where is this going to break down, where is this going to fail. And when they don't and they continue to persist, they're like, you know, maybe this idea is going to work. And so Loon is one of the first projects that sort of escaped from that system of trying to kill it and said, this is going to work. We just need to figure out how. Um, so it started, again, with a, a little weather balloon and an Android stunt, and we've come a long way since then. So in 2013, they were ready to sort of take the doors off and show everyone in the world what they were up to. They started in New Zealand. Um, we had the picture of the Southern Alps before, so we were launched out of a little town called Tikapo and wanted to connect people outside the city of Christchurch um, to the Internet. So there's, we, we don't have time to watch the video tonight, um, but there's a, a cool video they um, put together back in 2013 with a local farmer who needed to know when to shear his sheep based on the weather. And he was far enough outside Christchurch. He's like, I, I can't get a reliable weather report, but if it's going to rain in three days, I should shear my sheep in two when their wool is the most dry that it'll be for the next month. Um, just an example of a way that, you know, someone who's, you know, he's a sheep farmer, what does he need the internet for on some level? But it was actually really helpful to him. So we started back then. It was, I don't want to call it a stunt because that cheapens it, but it was, it was a small, limited demonstration of what Loon could do. They flew down there with probably 15 or 20 balloons that connected 50 people in a, a very rural area. It went super well, and it was, again, the next step in saying, this is going to work. We just need to figure out how. I joined the project in 2014. About three months after I joined, we did this demonstration in Brazil. So this was the first time we tried the LTE connection. That's kind of a common term now. I, it's probably familiar to all of you. So it's the, the next-gen cell technology um, that had been out for probably since 2008, 2009. Initially, we were using Wi-Fi. I mentioned we took a router, just like you would have in your living room, inside a, a styrofoam cooler from Safeway and flew it up to 60,000 feet. That works, but Wi-Fi has a lot of limitations. You can only have something like 1,500 people on a particular network, which is obviously plenty sufficient for your home, not so sufficient if you're trying to cover an 80-kilometer area. So switching to LTE also eliminated the need to have the little device on your house. You can see in this image here, there's a little red plastic balloon attached to this woman's garage. Um, that was the, the repeater device that Loon needed in the early days. By moving to LTE, we can go directly to devices. So we flew down to Brazil, partnered with the government, went out to a rural area where people, it was a big town, there was a school. To access the internet, they had to take a two-hour bus ride into the, na the nearest major city. And so for the first, it was really cool to see th these kids who were in school, you know, they're in eighth grade trying to learn about the world and they've never seen the internet unless they've taken a two-hour bus ride to the nearby bigger city. And so we flew a couple balloons overhead. You can see one of them here in the school in the background. And type in google.com and it pops up and all the kids are like, that's amazing. And then like, what do you want to know? Type in a question, the internet has the answer for you. And it was really fun to see that. Again, we're piloting the, the LTE technology and figuring out if we can steer from 50 miles away, how do we steer from 5,000 miles away? Um, so that's, again, about the time that I joined the project. Uh, we've, from then, scaled the, the size of the project, the, the scope of the team, tremendously. So I, when there were probably 30 or 40 people working on it. When I started, there's more than 200 working on it now. Um, so in 2015, we started doing a lot more manufacturing. So the early tests were very small in scope and scale. We'd fly down to New Zealand with 15 balloons or Brazil with 30 balloons. Um, but we said eventually, like, we want to cover 
huge areas, whether countries or continents, whatever. And so there's a lot of work um, that you have to do to manufacture at that kind of scale. So the balloon is one of the, one of the many challenges. When we started the project, you know, ballooning is a really small community. There's probably 15 balloonists in the world. And one of them famously said, like, you'll never have a balloon last more than 15 or 20 days. Um, they reliably last more than 100, as we'll talk about more in a little bit. So we did a bunch of testing starting in the early days, but expanding in 2015. So we're going to watch a video here now showing some of the testing that we did to make our balloons last longer. For Project Loon, our goal is to have long-lasting balloons. Our balloon manufacturing has evolved quite a bit from the beginning. Uh, we built all kinds of shapes of balloons. Uh, we have learned it the hard way that uh, ballooning is uh, both an art and a science. Our first batch of balloons lasted about a day and a half, two days. And over the course of one year, we went to 100 plus day durations. In order to verify a balloon is going to work or not, you almost need to actually fly it. The conditions at which we build the balloons is at room temperature, but the actual conditions these balloons endure is at 65,000 feet. And the temperatures are extremely low, like minus 60 degrees centigrade. You can take small patches of this foam and put it into a cold chamber, then run it through a whole bunch of tests. But the problem is you're taking a few square inches and trying to draw conclusions on a giant big balloon. So we found this place called McKinley Climatic Lab. They do extreme environmental testing there you know, sub-freezing temperatures down to minus 40 to minus 60 degrees centigrade. This one should be kind of over on that McKinley actually allowed us to bring stratosphere down to the ground and actually see these balloons as they would perform up in the stratosphere. We were interested in actually understanding the strain on the balloon. As the day comes on, the heat from the sun warms up the gas inside the balloon, so the balloon expands and it takes on more pressure. And as night falls, it starts to cool down and there's a drop in pressure. And we wanted to understand what is the impact. And so we simulated multiple number of these day-night cycles at those low temperatures in a very quick succession. We wanted to know exactly what areas the balloon was experiencing, how much strain, especially at cold, so that we can relieve that stress. And finally, we wanted to actually inflate a balloon and take it to burst. use high-speed cameras to actually slow down the burst process to exactly see the source of the burst. And I think that was very valuable for us to learn so that we can start to improve our design. In addition to increasing the lifespan of the balloons, we've been developing an efficient manufacturing technique which can actually scale with the needs of the program. We have unique equipment which actually cuts and seals at the same time. It only takes about two people in order to operate this whole thing as opposed to dozens of people on the previous design. These are repeatable, consistent, higher quality, manufacturable solutions. We learned a lot of new things. We also confirmed some of our old theories so that we can actually build better balloons and make project loans successful. All right, that's pretty cool, right? So a couple things to point out from that video. I didn't want to talk over um, Mahesh's voice as he was speaking, but so that climatic lab is run by the Air Force. It, uh, it'll actually fit airplanes as big as a C5 Galaxy inside. So the Air Force uses it to test all manner of things. They've tested the F-22 in there. They test C5s. They let us in twice to use their facility for a couple weeks. Uh, you saw the big dial outside, so it gets as hot as like 150 degrees Fahrenheit and as cold as about minus 100 Fahrenheit. Um, so we actually took it the coldest it had ever been to test our balloons, and it still wasn't quite cold enough to simulate the stratosphere, but it was close enough. Um, the day we did that, it was 115 outside, actually, which is kind of ridiculous. It's amazing just from a reliability perspective that their compressors could chill down a hangar the size of a C5 Galaxy to minus 55 Celsius when it's like 115 outside. Um, pretty cool. Uh, as you can see, the the dynamics of a burst and understanding how our balloon behaves in the cold is very different than how it behaves on a day like today or at, at, the, at sea level at all. And so it's very hard for us to test and develop our balloons if we can't recreate those conditions. All the other devices we work on, we can put in a small test chamber, something the size of a really big refrigerator perhaps, but the balloon, as you can see, the, the size there, those are smaller than what we fly now. Um, 
it's very hard to test that. So we're really thankful for how the Air Force let us in and, and let us use their facilities. We were very careful not to break anything while we were there, other than our balloon. Um, so that's just an example of the kind of testing that we have to do to, to recreate stratospheric conditions on the ground so that we can like learn from things that break and fail. You saw the, the mapped layer over the balloon with the like kind of polka dot texture. So what that did is it said here, we bonded all those dots were places where we adhered a piece of film in place. And then as we pressurize the balloon, they shift and they move slightly. And there's a special camera that watches like down to a micron where that dot is moving. And you can see exactly the stresses and strains as they develop in the film material. The material properties of that plastic are really different in the cold than they are room temperature. And so being able to see that behavior in its native environment in the stratosphere as if it were inflating in the stratosphere was really telling for us. All right, so that was some testing we did again in 2015. Moving forward into 2016, we really started to scale up the, the size of the operation. So this is another video. I'm sorry to keep jumping into videos, but I feel like the, the visuals are compelling. Um, this is our giant robot balloon launcher. <laughs> And that's what the launch is used to look like. Coverage. We're just transferring the signal from one balloon to the next as they pass over a, a stationary recipient. And so by having this continuous flow, we're always filling in the area that we need to provide the service to. And the biggest hurdle for a balloon is the wind. Once you've inflated the balloon, it gets quite large on the ground and acts as a large sail. It would catch the wind and it was really hard to control it. So then you try to find locations around the world that had zero wind. But then you're limited in scope because you can't find Watch these the perfectly wind-free zones that provide access to the location where you want to provide internet coverage. And then if we're given launch site, the ideal wind conditions would only exist for a very short period of the day, thus limiting the number of balloons we could get up in that period of time. We wanted to do something where we could launch one every 20 minutes. And so we needed to rethink how you would launch a balloon. We wanted to develop a launch system that would allow us to block the wind as much as possible and it could launch balloons from a number of different remote locations and be nimble enough to deploy into a new area as we expanded the program. We went into a very controlled environment and launched many balloons and measured all of the, all of the aspects of that launch. And then from there we developed our tooling in order to guide that motion. The auto launcher is 45 feet wide and 55 feet tall. The system is the four-tired steerable gantry crane, and we outfitted it with hangar doors that allows it to become a wind block. It's a highly customized piece of equipment. There's nothing else like this in the world. We lift the balloon right out of the box, so we don't ever have to do any extra handling to the balloon. We have jib cranes to lift up the balloon at the top of the balloon to secure it while we're filling it. The wind does not bother the team because we have the ability to steer the crane so we're always downwind. And when we're in the right wind pattern, we lift the entire perch up and then we angle the perch and then we launch the balloon. So where we had 16 people launching a balloon, we now can do it with four people, and we can do it in a very short period of time. We can now launch at will instead of at will of the weather, and we can launch in a consistent manner. So we can keep a continuous ring of balloons that circumnavigate the globe. All right, there's a lot of cool things to see in there. I've particularly just like the contrast from the very beginning when you see the guys holding the balloon on the ground and then ducking out of the way as it swings an inch over their head to now what we have where we have this giant robot that can block the wind. It sort of turns its back into the wind and allows us to just launch freely whenever we want. So we've come a long way in our launching infrastructure, which came in really handy a few years uh, down the road. 
So this is the, my favorite part to talk about. I have mentioned a few times that we, we navigate and guide the balloons using the wind. So that would be easy if you knew where the wind was going and what you're trying to do with it. Uh, there's a ton of algorithmic work that I don't understand at all. I just let, give them a lever to say, yeah, I want to go up or I want to go down. That's my job as a mechanical engineer. And there's a whole team of software engineers that work on all these incredible steering algorithms. So let's watch a, this is a little bit cartoony, but you get an idea for how this, the system works. All right, I'll read this out just because there's not audio. So in the stratosphere, there's a lot of layers of the wind that are stratified. They travel at different speeds and in different directions. We go up and down um, to catch the wind blowing in the direction we want, and that allows us to steer and guide uh, to the area we want to serve. We've learned a lot about the winds, that NOAA has a lot of models that they've you know, sent sounding balloons for decades. We imported all that data. Um, at this point, we've been flying for so long that we're, we have a lot better knowledge and understanding of where the winds are at a particular point in time. This shows how we cluster balloons over service area. We might have one that, that flies off to serve somewhere else, and you can see another one coming in from off the coast to, to serve in that area. Just to give you some idea, this is probably all the little wind vectors here are probably all the winds um, at one particular wind layer, and then there's you know winds traveling different directions, even five feet apart sometimes in the stratosphere. It's quite fascinating. Um, you can see in this this image on the uh, slide here, there's a really faint dotted, I'll use the laser pointer, I guess. There's a really faint yellow line starting up in the Caribbean, working its way off, out into the Atlantic, over the top of northern Brazil, and then serving this hot spot in Peru. Um, so that's the path that one balloon took. The, the red dot is the area that we were trying to serve. We launched from Puerto Rico, followed that big circuitous path because that's the direction that allowed us to get there with the wind. And then once we got to Peru, you can see it kind of it bumped around uh, using an older steering algorithm, trying to stay over that red dot. Uh, there's a ton of work. There's a whole team of software engineers that have been working on this for five years, and it's just been amazing watching the leaps and bounds that their steering predictions have improved by. I think when they launched the, the project back in 2012, 2013, it took them something like 15 minutes on a Google full data center to calculate the flight path for two weeks for one balloon. Um, we've flown hundreds of balloons over the years, and we've gotten way better at predicting where they're going to go. Um, we've cut that time down and done a lot more with, with algorithms and a lot less manual intervention by the flight engineers. All right, so now we're getting to the fun part. So there's a lot of work. All of this is cool if we can fly balloons and steer them where we want to go, but the end goal is really to connect users, right? And so we've started delivering connectivity to hundreds of thousands of people specifically in Peru and Puerto Rico. Um, we've been partnering with Telefonica, AT&T, and T-Mobile. for these types of settings, but we haven't had an opportunity to go out and make a difference in, in a disaster.
So as the video showed, there was a huge disaster in Peru. This is around about April of last year, and so I remember just showing up for work on a Friday morning, and, and our CEO pulled everyone into a, a conference room and said, we need to talk. Peru had been just totally devastated. I think something on the order of 200,000 homes had just washed away. You saw the images of like the, the huge torrents washing out bridges and stuff. Uh, a lot of their ground-based infrastructure had um, been damaged in the storms, and people had lost basic connectivity, even in developed cities. Um, you can imagine that in the, you know, the aftermath of a big disaster like that, having the internet probably doesn't feel like the, the world's biggest concern right then. You would want food and shelter and, and safety. Um, but on day two and three, the next thing you would want to know is, are my family and friends okay? And um, I remember the, the first summer that I was on the project in probably July or August of 2005, a really bad tropical storm and millions of people lost connectivity. And some guy in the Philippines made a YouTube video and uploaded it to YouTube, and it was like, Dear Loon, please come help us, basically. Um, it's a really cool way for someone to reach out in a really unusual way. Somebody saw it and said, hey, this is to us, and so we watched it, and he basically just put together a, a 30 or 60 second long plea for help, saying, like, we've got 30 million people that are all okay, but they just want to tell their mom or dad or son or daughter that. And unfortunately, back then, like, we had done the the demonstrations in New Zealand and Brazil, and so people had heard about us, but we weren't able to do that on demand very easily, and so we had to write back, and like, we would really love to help you, but it, right now it would take us months and months to have any kind of response, even to give you three days of internet coverage. Um, we've come a long way since then, though, um, and so we will talk in a minute about what we did in the, in the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. I, I briefly wanted to show you guys this, though. Um, people always ask it, that what's the, what happens at the end of the life cycle for a balloon, so if we go fly it for 100 days, what do we do at the end? And so there was a, a, a brief image in one of the earlier cartoons showing a, a balloon gently coming down to land under a parachute. This is you know, what we find when we drive out to pick it up. There's usually our flight vehicle on the bottom, all the solar panels are face down in the sand, and the balloon smeared out next to it. So we, we pick those up. Um, we have to do that worldwide right now. We're working a lot. I'm, that's a big part of my job as parting, part of the, uh, the guidance system is to say, not only can we get where we want to go, but we want to get back home. And so whether I want to fly it back to recover it in Nevada or some other recovery center, rather than the balloon going where it goes, and then we have to go find it there if it's in a tree in the Amazon or whatever. Um, this one was obviously really easy to drive up to, um, but sometimes they're a little bit more complicated than that. So we're working hard to work on recovery processes as well so we, we don't have to drive all over the, literally the entire globe, but rather we can fly and say, like, I've got a, a 10 by 10 mile that's you know, somewhere like Patagonia, for example, you could just drive around in a pickup truck and just pick them up and throw them in the back. Um, this is the end of life for a balloon. Hopefully it's at this point gone and served, you know, thousands of people for hundreds of days. Um, so where we're at right now, we have balloons that last as long as 190 days. Um, we have many, many, many balloons that last 100 days. So I mentioned earlier there's a uh, I don't want to call him a critic, but someone who said it's really hard to make balloons last a long time. You probably won't be 20 days. All that work that we did in the McKinley Climatic Lab, all the other work that we've done on all the rest of the hardware, we're, we're consistently making hardware last, you know, on the order of a quarter or two. Um, as of the end of last year, we traveled 27 million kilometers uh, with our fleet of balloons since the 2013 project launch. Um, we simulate about 30 million kilometers every single day um, working on our steering algorithms, trying to figure out if I go five feet higher or five feet lower, how do I do this a little bit better? That's really stressful for me as a mechanical engineer because every time we adjust the altitude, even if it's by five or 10 feet, all my system has to work. I need a valve to open, I need a turbo machine to run, all those cycles add up, and so it's hard for me to make the, the hardware last as long as the software wants to run it. Um, We've also delivered connectivity to hundreds of thousands of users. We've covered more than 50,000 square kilometers, um, particularly in Peru as well as in Puerto Rico. Um, all right, I want to shift gears now and talk about Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. So we've talked a little bit about the history of the project, some of the pieces of technology that we've developed along the way. As you probably all remember, it was a really rough year uh, in 2017 for natural disasters. So we saw Houston just get totally destroyed and flooded. They, fortunately retained most of their infrastructure. Um, shortly thereafter, the Florida Keys and Puerto Rico got totally hammered by hurricanes as well. If you recall from the, the video showing our recovery efforts in Peru, we actually launched out of Puerto Rico, and we, our launch site was like the eye of the hurricane went straight over the top of it, and it's like somebody took a pencil and just like erased our launch site off the map. Um, 
but those are our friends. Like we, those are our peers and our coworkers. Um, not a lot of ex employees were there. Like we evacuated the people from the launch site because you know the hurricane's coming a week out. But the contractors and the people that built that facility for us, they're friends and they're people that we had worked alongside for a long time. So we really, really wanted to help out in, in Puerto Rico. You can see here's a couple images of the aftermath of Hurricane Maria. So there's a sailboat parked across the road. I think almost every power line in the country was down. You can see whole cities underwater there. It was just devastating. Um, so we got a call for assistance. So this is Luis Arrocho. He's the CIO for the government of Puerto Rico. Um, he sent a LinkedIn message to Loon, not unlike that YouTube video that somebody had sent from the Philippines a long time before. Unlike four years ago when we were like, you know, we really can't do that. That takes us a long time to scale up a response. We were on the phone with him at 5 a.m. the next morning. Uh, my friend Anna jumped on the phone, sorted out some deals. Um, with the telcos, we basically told AT&T, like, we can get you all your customers back online, but you have to kind of give us the keys to your data center, so to speak. Um, so AT&T and a couple other telcos jumped in. It took a few weeks to iron out some of the uh, regulatory issues, like the spectrum licensing and things like that. The FCC. All these different parts of the U.S. and Puerto Rican government had to jump into action to make it work, but we got everybody online. So there were more than 100,000 citizens in Puerto Rico that we were able to reconnect. So you can see there's pieces jumping into, into play all over the place. So we had the launch site. We, there, you saw a lot of videos of Puerto Rico. There's also a few from Nevada, right? So that's our test facility. We mostly use that for R&D testing. We'll launch a balloon, fly it in circles for two days, and bring it back down to see how something works. Um, it's not intended to be a production site, but it was our only launch site because our primary one in Puerto Rico had been washed away. We had to get ground networks up in place. Um, we had to partner with AT&T, T-Mobile, the FCC, the Puerto Rican government, and, and obviously we had to get a lot of, of balloons in place. You can see in the image on the right here, that's very faintly the island of Puerto Rico, and we were able to cover everything with six balloons, um, zooming around, getting everybody back online. There were a lot of interesting stories that came, up, that came up along the way. We basically had to hitchhike our way into the country. You can imagine in the wake of a disaster of that scale, I think one of the, like the Eisenhower battle group followed the hurricane in and there's a huge influx of the military just bringing food and supplies. All the airports were just totally overwhelmed with, with FEMA and other resources. So we hopped on a plane that was bringing water filters to San Juan and said we just need to get a couple people on site to put a couple things in place. Um, when we got back to our launch site, you can see the large crane to the left side of the, the right image. So we had kind of taken all the like, sensitive equipment off of that and said, hopefully this thing will ride out the storm. It was still there. The facility that serviced it was not. Um, the building was basically just completely destroyed. As I mentioned, the eye of the hurricane went, like, made landfall at our launch site. Um, we also found a few new guests staying there. So the 26th Marine Expeditionary Unit had made it their home base. The Air Force had brought in a mobile uh, air, air traffic control tower. We had chosen this site because it was an abandoned Air Force facility. And so I don't know if in the 50s or when, at some point it was an active military installation. It had been abandoned for decades. And we're like, cool, like this is a, effectively an airstrip that no one is ever going to use again. We'll just set up camp here, obviously making that, sure that was OK with everyone. Well, it was a functioning airstrip, and we came back, and there was just C-5 after C-5 after C-17. I mean, it looked like a war movie from Vietnam, just helicopters just streaming in and out. It was unbelievable to see the response of the military and the National Guard bringing resources in and uh, injured people out. Um, there's some funny things. So you can see we have this giant robot crane that we'd taken most of our equipment off of. We eventually got that back up and running, but we actually used it for a few other things in the meantime. So they, they had Chinook helicopters that were trying to bring diesel fuel and generators to restore power locally in, in key areas around the island. They couldn't fly those helicopters all the way down there, so they brought them in on a marine ship, carried them ashore, and then used our crane to actually lift the rotors in place and reinstall the rotors on the helicopter. Um, I've heard some funny stories about the, the various things that we traded and bartered for. Um, along the way, we were like, hey, we need one generator. Can we get 20 gallons of diesel fuel? And they're like, well, if you do this. And so there's a, there's a lot of really fascinating stories. It's really cool, actually, to hear people that from really different walks of life coming together and just trying to help in a, a disaster situation. Um, so I mentioned we had to launch from Winnemucca, Nevada. The reason that's our R&D test facility is it doesn't have very favorable winds to leave North America. Um, it's a great spot if you want to launch, fly around over the desert for a while and come back down. It's not a great spot if you're trying to get out to the Caribbean. And so you can see here these yellow dots zooming around. 
this is accelerated on, the, we're looking at the, about a week's worth of flights um, in a, a couple seconds here. Um, so you can see them up here over Nevada right now, and then they zoom down over Florida out to Puerto Rico. Um, that was not easy to do, so we had to task our algorithm team again and say, I know you've been working on trying to get from Puerto Rico to Peru, now we need to like, really finely optimize from Nevada to Puerto Rico. And so they jumped into, into action and tried to figure out the best way to do that. Meanwhile, once we get into Puerto Rico, we want to stay there, and so we want to get there as fast as we can and hit the brakes and just camp out over the top of the island and, and serve people while we're there. Um, to do that, we, had, we did need to get a ground station into place, and so that, that was the sort of hitchhiking joke, if you will, trying to get a team in place to just set up one ground station that could then power, like basically provide the internet pipeline to all the balloons. It worked really well. Um, we were able, this is an example, this is from our mission control software, so those five green circles are five coverage areas under five balloons. Um, the green lines are the, the uplinks from a ground station connecting to that balloon, so everyone under a green circle was restored to have uh, connectivity. Um, we had a lot more than five balloons that we used to do this. Um, we would sort of fly five and then five more and they'd circle around and eventually, you know, a rogue wind would grab one and, and slip it out to sea and then we'd fly another one in. Um, it was really awesome. The, the, the coolest part about it though is it, inter, it really demonstrated our ability to interoperate with an existing network. So some of the cell providers, like I mentioned AT&T and others, um, they have something called a cell on wheels that they can bring in after a disaster. So like in Houston, if a cell tower blew over, they just back up a trailer and pop one back up in its place and run it off a generator for a little while. They did stuff like that in the major cities. So like the city of San Juan you know, has way more citizens than we would want to try to serve because we're really targeting our technology for rural sort of diffuse areas. So we said, hey, like we're going to cover everything but a city like San Juan, for example. And so we can basically just draw lines on a map and say like we're going to geofence and not serve those people and serve everyone else and, and our networks didn't collide and clash. If you've ever lived in a, a really dense apartment complex that has, you know, every apartment has two or three routers going, um, there's a lot of space in the RF spectrum but things do get a little crowded sometimes. So it was really cool to see that we were able to play nice um, with existing uh, terrestrial cell coverage. All right, this is the last video, I promise, and then we'll have some uh, lengthy time for Q&A. But this one is really cool. So it includes Luis Arrocho, I mentioned, was the CIO of Puerto Rico. And it just sort of shows soup to nuts what I just described, the, the actions that it took to restore Puerto Rico to the internet. When I really realized what was going on was the next day I was trying to call my dad. I was trying really hard to, to communicate with him and I couldn't. This was me, a government official, and was not being able to communicate with, with his father. I didn't expect it was going to be this bad. I knew it was going to be bad, but I wasn't expecting it was going to be this bad. We had internet before Maria, we had so many things and we depended on the internet of, for everything. So we actually have two, uh, two launch sites, one's in Puerto Rico and one's in Winnemucca. Um, and what happened when Hurricane Maria blew through is it took out a substantial portion of our facilities in Puerto Rico. Um, so we switched to launching out of Winnemucca and we had to find kind of new ways to navigate the balloons down to Puerto Rico to respond to the emergency. The balloon actually wasn't uh, designed for disaster response, but because we already had ground infrastructure in Puerto Rico, we were able to quickly respond. I'm excited that we were able to provide basic connectivity to uh, hundreds of thousands of people after the hurricane. Some of the things that we learned from this experience were that before a disaster strikes, we need to secure spectrum, import all of our equipment, and test the full system so that we can restore connectivity as quickly as possible. There's got to be a playbook for disaster. Telecommunication has become uh, a necessity. So I'm a firm believer that Loon should be part of that disaster response playbook for telecommunication. We're going to get back. We have to get back. We were doing it before and we can do it again. And the internet is going to do that.
Oops. Um, all right, oops, sorry. That was what I prepared. So I think it was really cool for me personally, just after working on Loon for all those years, um, to see where we had started in, in New Zealand, that's when I signed on to the project, to see what we did in Brazil shortly thereafter. Um, to see all those pieces come together in just a, a few short weeks after Hurricane Maria just totally destroyed Puerto Rico, it was really fun for me to, to see it not be a no, we can't do that, or we can do that six months from now, but uh, let me make a couple phone calls to at and and the FCC, and within maybe, let's call it three weeks or so, we had everybody back online. Um, it wasn't like the fastest internet, we're working on that too. Um, if you wanted to like stream 4K cat videos or whatever, it wasn't the best for that. But it definitely was something where you could reach out and send emails and shoot text messages, reach out and figure out who in your community would need help or whatever. Um, so it was really rewarding for me just to see all those pieces come together, all the you know, four and a half years of stress and late nights and hard work pay off in a system that could come together and actually work. We launched from Nevada, flew all the way across the eastern seaboard and down into Puerto Rico. Um, that's what I prepared. I'm going to stop talking and let you guys ask questions. I really love questions. It's hard for me not to ask you to interrupt me along the way. So please let her rip. Um, there's a few things I can't talk about, like trade secrets and things like that, but I'll do my best. Um, keep in mind, I'm a mechanical engineer, not a business person or a communications person or uh, RF and so on. Yeah, perfect. First of all, thank you very much uh, yeah, for this pleasure. presentation. Um, I think that's great and it's also it's so amazing to see what impact uh, you made with this project. So that's really nice. Um, I saw there's a question right here. Yes. Thank you. How much does device weigh? How do you make it go up and down? And how do you know the uh, direction of the wind over there, up there, down there, so you can decide how to move it around? Yeah, I, uh, I love answering that question. So the weight um, varies from system to system. As you, if you were paying a lot of attention to the videos along the way, you see the early ones, there's one big solar panel, and then there's two solar panels, and then three and four. We've been getting bigger and heavier as we go. Um, right now, we're flying a system that is somewhere in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 kilograms. Um, so roughly double that, call it 100 pounds, and that's a lot of batteries at solar panels and radios and parachute and all that stuff. That's not including the balloon. I actually don't know off the top of my head how much the balloon weighs, um, but it's 50 to 60 kilograms for the main flight vehicle that I work on. You also asked, what do we do to go up and down and then how do we know where the wind is going, right? So to go up and down, this is my favorite part. So to, to guide the balloons, we, it's just like steering a submarine, actually. So there's a balloon inside the balloon. Um, so the, the main lift gas chamber holds helium or whatever you know, lighter than air gas you want to fly with. We use helium. The inner, the balloon inside the balloon is basically a bellows that we pump air into. So air is denser than helium. Um, it's a fixed volume super pressure balloon. And so when we add heavy air, the density of the balloon goes up and the neutral buoyant point goes down. And so we pump in a lot of air, like call it you know, 100 liters or 1,000 liters. Um, that'll cause us to go down 10 or 100 feet. And so if we just keep pumping air in to the separate chamber, we go down as much as four kilometers and then we um, hold it. It's, it's not unlike lungs, actually. Maybe that's a better example than bellows. We can pump the air in, hold it, and then when I want to go back up, I open a valve, I, and then the pressure from the balloon in the other, the pressure from the helium in the other chamber pushes the air back out. So there's a, a thin barrier between them. They don't intermingle. That allows us to keep the lift gas preserved as lift gas and not co-mix with the, the heavier air. And so we basically use the air just the way a submarine uses water. Um, so we go up and down like that. As far as knowing where the winds go, I, I, I kind of flew through it earlier, but NOAA, the, uh, the National Oceanographic something something agency, they've been flying sounding balloons for decades. And so they actually, I think maybe worldwide, basically take little balloons about that big, put a little sensor on it, and they just fly it up. And it records a couple things, including wind direction, air temperature, probably a few other things. And it just goes up and records that from the ground all the way up until the point where it pops. Um, above 60,000 feet. So those are called sounding balloons. NOAA has like mountains of data from decades and decades. We use that to pick our launch sites. We can say, what are the you know historical, over the course of 40 years, weather patterns for this airport or for that area in Nevada or Puerto Rico or whatever. Um, 
So we start with that. That's a mountain of data that I wouldn't want to go through, but again, we use a lot of like really cool algorithms. Dump all that in. I'm a computer thinks about it for 10 minutes and is like, oh, it's going to do this. So at this point, I want to be here, and at this point, I want to be here, and at that point, I want to be there. That'll cause me to go east across the US, south into the Caribbean, and then west over to Puerto Rico. I'm oversimplifying it a lot, obviously. Um, but as a mechanical engineer, that's about as well as I understand it. Um, the, the other interesting thing is, so NOAA has done that for a long time with sounding balloons. In the areas where we're operating, I think we know way better than they do at this point, because I can say, I had a balloon fly over 10 minutes ago, and it was actually 10 feet higher or 10 feet lower would have been a little bit better. Um, and so we're sort of building our own cloud of data from the regions where we have served. So we know a lot about the, the weather over Nevada, for example, because we do all of our short flights there. I know a lot about the weather leaving Puerto Rico, because that was our launch site. It's back up and, up and running now as well. And I know a lot about the weather in Peru. Um, we've been talking with a lot of other uh, ag agencies, so like the European Space Agency and CNES and NASA. Like all the, the scientific community is very interested in, in trying to figure out what they can do with the data that we've collected as well. I don't know very much about the partnerships that we have with them, um, but I know that we took their data to start and we're able now to provide even more high fidelity um, real-time data after we fly through with a balloon. Hi. Um, I guess your, your mission is to provide internet to uh, all over the world. Um, how many balloons would you need for this mission to provide consistent internet connection? Um, that's a great question. So when I started the project, the, the mission of Loon was definitely they wanted to blanket the world in balloons. Um, I want to say it was on the order of 100,000 balloons would have been required to do that. Um, I don't know all the like asterisks that would need to follow that statement. Um, that may have been to cover the land, but like ignore cruise ships in the ocean or um, things like that. What we basically planned to do and back then, our steering wasn't as effective, and so we would basically say, we're going to launch out of Tikopo, New Zealand. You, know, you saw the picture at the beginning of the presentation from the Southern Alps. If I launch from Tikopo, I'm going to fly out of New Zealand, zoom across the Pacific Ocean, cruise across Chile, uh, maybe the tip of Argentina, um, go over South Africa to Australia and back to New Zealand. And so for that latitude band, call it 10 degrees from whatever that is, minus 40 to minus 50 latitude, southern latitude, um, we would have flown about 10,000 balloons and we could have covered all the countries that I mentioned in a giant belt that would just kind of circle the globe. Um, that was before we figured out we could actually fly against the wind, if you will. Um, and so we've now dramatically reduced the number, the number of balloons that we need to cover a particular area. So we no longer think about like, we're gonna cover the globe or we're gonna cover from the equator down to minus 50 degrees southern latitude. We just say, we're going to cover this region of like Puerto Rico. You can see we covered that island with five balloons. Um, I can't talk a lot about the, the areas that we're going to next. There's a lot of partnerships that are in the works and things. If you watch the news over the next couple of years, you'll, see, you'll hear more about it. Um, but I definitely, we, from the technology side, we've gone from needing 100,000 balloons to darken the skies um, to 10,000 balloons. You know, it's an order of magnitude decrease with uh, improvements we've made in the steering algorithm and improvements that my friends and, and team have made in the hardware that actually allows us to like steer the balloon or, or guide it up and down more effectively. Thank you, this is fascinating. Um, so in any one point in time you have 10,000 balloons up in the air, is that what you're saying? Definitely not what I'm saying. Um, I, that's what we thought we would need to do if we, if we were going to cover an entire spectrum uh, or, or latitude band of the globe. So we have flown a lot of flights at this point. We definitely have not flown 10,000. Um, in 2014, when I joined the project, the, the vision of the project leader at the time was bringing it to the entire globe. And we're, we're realizing we need to be a little more strategic and, and focusing on, on key areas, partly because flying 100,000 things at a particular point in time is doable. People make 100,000 cars in a year, we can make 100,000 balloons in a year. Um, but there are areas that need it sooner or more urgently, and so we're, we're trying to figure out and slow down, not try to just fill the sky with balloons, but be really strategic and, um, and partner with the people that, that need it the most. But that, what I'm asking is, in any one day, like today, how many balloons might be up there? I'm sorry, I misunderstood. Um, I actually haven't looked recently. I should. Um, I should have checked that before coming tonight. It's probably anywhere between 
10 and 60 balloons at a given point in time right now. Don't quote me on that. I could be like way off on that. Um, but we, we're, we're continuing to serve in Peru. Um, we're, we sort of have, we have partnerships where we're doing ongoing testing there. So there's some number of balloons over Peru. That could be 10, it could be 20. Um, we aren't serving Puerto Rico anymore. So AT&T and the other um, uh, telecommun telecommunications providers said, hey, it's been six months. We're all ready now. We're going to turn our system back online and you can fly your balloons away. So we've stopped serving over Puerto Rico. Um, but on any given week, I think we're anywhere, but probably not even at the 60 um, point. I, at one point, we had more than 100. It really just depends what we're testing, what we're developing, where we're doing a partnership test, um, and so on. So it, it, it really varies dramatically. I think once we start doing big commercial service, that number will, that will go way up. I don't know that we'll do 10,000, um, but it'll be a lot more than 10. Hey, um, I know you guys are doing something big right now, but as far as scaling the business and trying to, you know, make the, the business case for it, and can you sort of talk about the challenges is trying to get this technology accepted to other, maybe other countries or maybe other regions that are not sort of um, there yet? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's, as you alluded to, there's, there's probably a lot that I, I can't talk about. Um, one of the big challenges is we need to operate globally, right? And so Google isn't totally well-loved globally. There are certain countries that are not fans of an open internet, for example. And so that's really hard to say, you know, we're, we're flying over at 60,000 feet, but they're like, that thing still says Google on the side. I'm not interested. You can't fly in our airspace. Um, it is, uh, it's very open up there. Like there's a lot of space um, at 60,000 feet but it's still sovereign airspace for the countries that we're flying over. And so we have to go country by country, you know, for hundreds of, of nations and say, hey, we promise there's no cameras, there's no code from the NSA, like there's, there's nothing malignant here. We just need to fly overhead because we want to go serve there next, right? And so, you know, I don't think we actually flew over Cuba, but I think Cuba would have let us fly over them if we needed to to get to Puerto Rico, for example, right? So that's, that's one challenge is this, obtaining what we call overflight permission and, and making sure that we aren't offending anyone's neighbors. If I'm trying to help group A, but I need to fly over group B, we got to make sure that that's okay. It's funny, I'm the next door from, from my neighborhood. I live in Sunnyvale and we're right underneath the short final approach path from Moffitt. And so we get tons of angry messages every single day. People are like, these airplanes are so loud. Um, our balloons are very quiet, but the, the same effect could happen, right? Like one country could say, I, I don't want these 20, vehicles flying over my airspace. It's taken a long time. I think we're getting there. Um, five years ago, people like, you want to fly? Why are you calling me about a balloon? Like, you know, they imagine a party balloon. I'm like, it's a little bit bigger than that. And I'm telling you because I want to fly it over the top of your country or whatever. Um, so that's one challenge um, on the, the business or commercial side. Um, there's a lot of different challenges. There, none of them are insurmountable by any means. Um, the technology, it's really cool that we were able to prove that it works in Puerto Rico, right? And so um, we had proven that the, that the technology could work in Peru with the, that, the small response we did over the cities that were destroyed by the floods. Um, but because their ground infrastructure was completely destroyed, we weren't trying to, we didn't have to do the play nice with their network thing. Puerto Rico allowed us to say, we are partnering with AT&T and T-Mobile and probably Verizon. I don't remember who the other carriers were. We are working with them and it works interoperably with them really well. So you could be like in San Juan on the phone via a cell tower and walk 20 feet further to the west and then sort of drop off that cell tower and, and a loom balloon would pick you up. And so that was huge for us to say, we can partner with these guys. Our technology plays well with their technology. As a user, it's basically seamless. It's no different than you transferring from one cell tower to another as you drive down the highway. Did I answer your question? Kind of. Hi, first I just want to say thanks. This was an awesome talk. Yeah, um, my pleasure. So my question is more so about like the kind of culture at uh, X in general, kind of from a first-hand perspective, and yep. then also how kind of design plays into um, innovative projects within X. Yeah, I'd, uh, I'd love to talk about that. So um, X was in the news a lot about four or five years ago. Astro Teller, who Kay referenced, um, is, is famous for encouraging people to fail. And so he, he sort of 
he went on record saying, if anyone fails, I will give them a hug. If you make a thing and it just breaks into a thousand pieces, you get a hug out of that. Um, and, and the reason he's encouraging them to fail fast is because you learn fast that way, right? And so it's a really interesting environment where failure is very much encouraged. encouraged. They're not saying, go spend $20 million on something and then break it. Um, but they're saying, it's okay to try and experiment. You can see just from the videos I showed, the technology we were flying, the hardware we were flying five years ago, looks really different than the technology and hardware that we're flying now. That's not because the old stuff worked super well, right? And so there's a, a really cool culture of let's hack something together. We're not trying to totally invent new technologies, right? We're, we're taking balloons, which are a thing, and routers, essentially, which are a thing, and duct taping them together and throwing them in the stratosphere to see if we can solve a problem with it. And so it's a really sort of unique place where they're not afraid to be a little audacious and try something that sounds a little crazy, like take a styrofoam beer cooler and attach it to a weather balloon. And if it works, keep going down that road. Failure is encouraged not like in catastrophic ways, but in ways that help you learn quickly. Um, there's a second half of your question. I forget what else you asked me. The role of oh, right, the role of design. So um, can you elaborate? Just what do you mean by design? Do you mean like a mechanical design or industrial design or? Yeah, I guess I mean more so like industrial design or even like design thinking. Like, yep. I don't know, more of Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a useful clarification. So I'm a mechanical engineer, and when I hear the word design, I'm thinking I'm going to go like put a screw here and a little boss over there, and like I'm in CAD tinkering around. Um, there's a whole design research team at X, actually. I don't know the exact size of the team, but it's big. It's not like two people hiding in a corner. It's a huge part of what we do. Um, there's a, a, a woman named Obi Felton who was famously um, put in charge of preparing moonshots for contact with the real world was I think what she said her job description was. And she's a designer essentially. She's saying, that's a really cool idea you had, like bullets that only kill bad guys. But no one really wants us to, like no one wants to hear that Google is designing bullets, right? So we're not gonna do that. Um, and, and that, she sort of started that idea saying, we need to have ideas that are actually palatable to the real world. Um, Loon kind of pushes those boundaries just the right amount, right? Like it doesn't look scary. It's a big party balloon that, you know, the fact that it's a party balloon and all the infographics, um, it's probably deliberate upon the design team's part because they're trying to make it palatable. It doesn't say like NSA on the side or, or, or whatever, right? Um, I don't have a lot of interaction with that group because I'm squirreled away in the lab trying to make a turbo machine work super well. But there's definitely, it's a big part of X because they know that they're trying to push the boundaries on solutions, but they need to have it be something that's palatable. And so the design team is a huge part of that, saying this thing doesn't look scary or sound scary. We're not describing it scarily. This is a really innocuous thing that's going to hopefully do a lot of good for the world. Hi, Kevin. Thanks for being here. Yeah, this my pleasure. really exciting stuff. Um, so I have two, uh, two questions. Kay. One part is, how long does it take to manufacture one of these balloons? And then the second part is, after recovery, um, what do you guys do with the material? Is it recyclable? It's plastic, right? Can you just patch that it up? That is a super fun question to answer. So um, <laughs> the first question asked, if you couldn't hear, was how long does it take to manufacture one of these balloons? I don't actually know on the balloon. I think it's on the order of tens of minutes. Um, there was a, in one of the videos they showed there was a heat seal. It was like this big beam arm that came down, like smushed against a sheet of plastic and picked up and scooted down and went down. What that was doing is it was sealing the, the gores of the pumpkin. So there's sort of, on uh, the images you saw where the balloon was inflated, it sort of has these rippled curved edges. Those are individual pieces of plastic and that, that heat sealer um, is uh, applying an RF pulse basically to, to weld the plastic together. So that process is actually really fast because it's been automated. Um, the rest of the system, all the stuff that I designed, so I work on basically everything except the balloon. I should have clarified that earlier. Um, the rest of that, it really varies. We make some of it in-house. Some of it is made with manufacturing partners. Um, I, like I mentioned, I work, I design the batteries. It only takes probably less than 15 minutes to make one of our batteries, for example. So um, maybe that's because I'm an amazing engineer. Maybe it's because they're not actually that big of batteries. Like we don't have, we can only lift so much. And so a lot of the hardware is pretty small. Um, it's designed to be light and resilient and last a really long time. So does that kind of answer your question about, okay. It really depends on from one system to another. Is it the, you know, the batteries take that long. The balloon takes, I don't know if it's 30 or 60 minutes or something. Um, there are some pieces of the system that are extremely complex that would take longer, certainly. Um, the second question you asked is what, what's beyond, so I showed the image of a, a balloon smeared across a sand dune. What happens to that balloon next? So what we thought we wanted to do was go pick those up and recover the components and maybe I can reuse that battery or reuse some other part of the system. 
What's happened, what's been really cool actually to see uh, play out over time is when we land, we're usually landing you know, in some foreign country and they oftentimes have much more creative solutions for what they're gonna do with our system than what we thought. So I would have said, I'm gonna pack that up, ship it back to Mountain View and harvest what I can and I'll recycle the rest, for example. They're looking at it saying, um, this balloon material would make an amazing roof for my hut. And so we, we landed one in Africa once and when we showed up to pick it up, they're like, you can't have this, we want all of this. And they're cutting up the balloon and like putting it over the roof of their hut, and like that is totally waterproof and like it's worthless to us. It's flown for 100 or 200 days or whatever. Um, but to them, like they don't get chunks of plastic that big anywhere. Um, and they're just sitting in their village in Africa, like this is super useful. Um, the coolest one, I, I meant, you know, we've talked a little bit about Peru. We've been flying in Peru for a while, developing different stages of testing there. Um, so we've landed a fair number of flights in Peru. We always go get them and pick them up, but if people beat, them, beat us to them, or sometimes we get there at the same time and they're like, hey, I was guarding this for you so no one else would steal it, will you give me 50 bucks? And you're like, okay, fine, here's 50 bucks. Um, and can I take the solar panels home? And you're like, you know what, sure. Like, we want like, the best solar panels because we want every possible electron we can get. I don't have the mass budget to fly like 400 batteries. I can fly eight or 10 and so, I want the best solar panels so I can get the most possible electrical energy out of the light and into those batteries. Um, once it's flown and, and landed, the solar panel is, I wouldn't want to use it anymore. But the people down there, there's, there's, they have these moto taxis where they basically take a dirt bike, weld a bench seat across the back bumper, um, and then that's the, it's a moto taxi. So like I was actually in Peru in 2003 in a rural uh, village or city called Pacalpa, and we rode around in those things. They're super fun. Uh, funny story, if you tip the guy five extra bucks, he'll ride faster than everybody else and beat, you, beat all your friends to the ice cream shop. Um, so those motor taxis have said, hey, this is a super premium solar panel. I'm gonna put it, like, build a roof and electrify my bike. And so we're showing up and they're like, I'm like, I recognize that solar panel. It's driving around on top of the motor taxis now. And so there's just an example, like the solar panels are certainly one of the most reusable parts of the system. Everyone, they're recognizable and there's two wires hanging off and if you stick your fingers on them, there's a little electrical charge. Um, so it's really cool to see other people who are way more creative than us saying, I'm just gonna take this and run with it. Um, you can have the rest, but I want the solar panel or I want the balloon to put uh, you know, a new roof on my hut or it's a lot thinner than a tarp. Like I wouldn't want it on my roof long-term, um, but if it's that or thatched grass, like it's a huge improvement. Hi, Kevin. Um, I imagine the recycling answer might be different if you guys decide to fly them back in future, right? Yep. Also, for like funding and revenue, it's just like, is this like a CSR thing? So like infinite, it can just scale infinitely because there's infinite funding or? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> I can't comment on the funding. Um, I um, sometimes I'm super thankful to be an engineer and I'm like, I'm just gonna sit over here and solve all the problems that I can. Um, we, there are certainly aspects of the system that we want to reuse. Um, I always want to reuse the batteries because I think that we can get a bunch of flights out of one of the batteries that I've designed. It gets complicated because if I land it in my backyard, I can pick it up and drive it back into work really quickly. Like you said, if we flew them all home, um, it would be a lot easier to do that. The problem with, or the, one of the challenges with doing that is it might take me 15 or 20 days to get back from Peru to Nevada, for example. That's 20 days that I wasn't using that balloon to serve somebody, and so we have to kind of look at the economics for you know, reusing the components versus getting 20 more days of you know, useful service out of the balloon, landing it locally, and letting the, the local economy sort of uh, recycle or repurpose or reuse what they want out of it. Thank you, great talk. Um, two, two questions, a uh, little bit separate. One is, uh, yeah, you fly uh, twice as high as an airline, but you're also going up and down. So yep. how, how do you deal with the FAA and air uh -huh. traffic and such? And the second one is, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, competitive concepts that are also underway to try and blanket the world with mm -hmm. internet coverage. Yep, and, okay. And so the, the first question was, it's great that we cruise along at 60,000 feet way over commercial aviation and everything else. Um, what about on the way up and the way down? So the only other thing that goes more or less straight up and then hopefully never straight down are rockets. So they basically treat a balloon launch just like a rocket launch. So when they're gonna launch a you know, Atlas rocket out of Cape Canaveral, they just say like, here's a spot in Florida and they're, we're gonna build a tunnel of airspace from there all the way up to space and no one flies through that and there's gonna be a rocket coming through at some point. We, we, yeah, yeah, so we, we just tell you, we, file, we file a flight plan with the FAA saying I'm going from ground to 60,000 feet in this tunnel and they're like, cool, no problem. 
Um, it, it's the same way they treat a rocket launch. We actually file a flight plan continuously, just like any other plane. So if you were going to fly from Palo Alto to South Carolina, you would say, hey, I'm going to you'd file a flight plan saying, I'm going from here to here and I'm planning to do it this way. If you got halfway and said, actually, I want to divert and go have lunch in Baton Rouge, you would radio some tower and say, I'm changing my flight plan to now land in Baton Rouge and here's the path I'm going to take there. So we do all that. Initially, there were human beings like me. Uh, uh, the one I remember, there were two guys, Jason and Eric, for example, sat about 20 feet from me and they were just on the phone constantly saying, hey, like Puerto Rico, we're coming through. Cool things, just wanted to let you know. Hey, Florida Keys, we're coming through. Just want to let you know, cool things. And every time we transitioned airspace, they would pick up the phone and call and say, hey, we're coming through. Here's, you know, there's a flight number. Um, you can actually track them yourself. So if you go to, I forget if it's flightaware or flightradar24.com, if, if you search for highball, you can actually see all the loon balloons that are flying right now. Because they, they have transponders. They report their, con their location continuously. We communicate with them via satellite. Like the Iridium network or Inmarsat, there's a lot of different satellite communication networks. They're super expensive and super slow, so you wouldn't want to use it to watch cat videos or like stream the internet. But if I need to send a command or, or no, it's exactly right here via GPS, that means I'm going from this airspace to that airspace, I need to go tell somebody. We've also automated the process so you know, Jason and Eric, for example, don't have to like pick up the phone every 15 milliseconds now that we're flying you know, dozens or hundreds. Um, but a computer says, knock, knock, hey, you know us, we're coming through, here's the flight plan, here's the, here's the transponder ID. And so, and we're so, we're so high, we're in, it's, I forget what it's called, it's not like unregulated airspace, but it's, it's, it's flight level 600, and so basically we just say we're coming through, and they're like, yeah, we don't care. It's, it's us and spy planes at that altitude, and so you know, we, we don't really know anything about the spy planes, and they don't want to know anything about us or us to know about them, and so we just kind of, la, 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 don't worry about it. Um, but in, essentially, in essence, that's what we do. So we, we take off like a rocket from an airspace, perspective. Um, and we have, there's a transponder that, you know, communicates just like a 737 and says, I'm here, I'm going this direction. Um, there's also other things you see on commercial aviation. So there's like little flashers, like the, you know, red and blue, or sorry, red and green lights on the wingtips. And in the flasher on the tail of a 737, we fly all that hardware. So um, you can, you can only see in one or two of the videos, but the solar panels are the, the most easily visible part of the system other than the balloon. So on the, for the four corners of the outermost solar panels, we fly some really bright LEDs and they flash at, you know, and they're the right wavelength and the right frequency and all that stuff. And so if we, you know, were to fly a balloon somewhere where we didn't intend, I'm like, it's not possible that we've designed a system, but if you were in a commercial aviation lane, you would be flashing along just like the 737 behind you. You'd be like, there's a plane up there or something. Um, you asked me a second question. What are some of our competitors? So I actually, Again, this is where I um, plead the fifth because I'm just an engineer over in the lab trying to f um, make things work. I don't totally know. There are certainly satellites. They were on the, the early infographic I showed saying, here's Everest, here's a 737, here's us, and satellites are at 200 kilometers. There are a couple efforts in that space. I know there's, is it One World? Somebody, Elon with SpaceX was talking about something. There's a couple other people that are working on communication satellites that would be fast enough to provide useful internet. I have no idea about the pricing or the timing for when those um, constellations come online. I don't know if it's five or 10 years out. Um, those are also probably better suited to a targeted area. Like you would want to park a satellite over North America or over the, I don't even know if they cover a continent or a city um, in terms of the, the beam width. Um, what, where we feel like we have a special niche in the market is to say we can cover the really diffuse areas because the satellites like, $200 million and another $200 million to put it in orbit, if I can build a balloon system that's like 0.1% you know, of that cost or you know, whatever it costs, I can make a whole bunch of them and then cover all the rest of the continent where there's not a high population density, but there are still people, like we've heard some stories from, that would really benefit from having access. So I, that's not to say we don't have any competitors. I honestly am not sure who they are. <laughs> yep. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, you said that helium is used in the balloons. Isn't that a, a limited, expensive resource? And is that a problem with 10,000 of them using yeah, large amounts um, of helium? That's one question. The okay. second question is, what's the long-term business model for these? Who would pay for it? Yep. Okay, so we do use helium. There are other lift gases we could use. Hydrogen is really popular. We don't use that. Um, it's it's fun to use. I, I think I'm allowed to say that. I like, I'm, a, I'm a chemical engineer. I understand thermodynamics. I think hydrogen is cool. Um, I was just at NASA uh, Johnson Space Center last week 
with my six-year-old showing him a Saturn V and we went on the space shuttle independence and they did a really cool demo at NASA where they had balloons filled with helium, carbon dioxide, and hydrogen and they let other people poke matches into the first two and then a rocket scientist pokes the third one. And it was my son was like, oh my goodness, that was awesome. So I similarly really think hydrogen is cool. We're not using that on Loon. Um, there's a huge um, hydrogen ballooning festival in New Mexico at the spaceport every year. And there's people like standing around smoking cigarettes and like taking basically hot air balloons with hydrogen and just zooming around in them. Um, we're, we're not going down that road. Um, there are other lift gases you can use, certainly. Helium is what we've been using. Um, interestingly, and I don't quote me on the numbers here, but helium has gotten a lot cheaper in the last five years. Um, it's, it, if you're unfamiliar, uh, you probably are familiar, you actually have to mine it out of the ground. Um, I'm not sure how it goes from gas form back into the ground, if that's like a, over hundreds of thousands of years thing or what, but you mine helium. It's become a lot, it's proliferated dramatically because of fracking, apparently. Um, that's a, about the limit of my understanding of it, but I guess as, as fracking has taken over in the gas industry and trying to get like um, gas and oil out of unusual places, they've unlocked huge helium deposits as well. And so I think something on the, like we've had like an order of magnitude decrease in the cost of helium um, in the time I've worked on the project. I can't, again, speak to like, I know, so I worked at Tesla before. If everyone on the planet went and bought a Tesla, there wouldn't be enough lithium to make the batteries. I, I know that from a long time ago. I don't know if there's enough to make like 500 billion um, helium balloons or not. I'm, I'm not really sure what the, it certainly is a, you know, a finite resource and um, at some point the, you know, the, Earth, the planet would run out. Yes, thank you. Um, oh, sorry, he had, uh, I forgot. He had a, a second question about the long-term business model. Um, I'll, I'll come back to you in just a second, I'm sorry. Um, thanks for the reminder. I can, I'm not the best person to speak to the long-term business model. I can just say that there's, we're exploring a lot of opportunities. You know, we've, Loon's goal has always been the mobile network expansion. Like, we want to bring the internet to people that have devices but don't have reliable internet, whether that's because they're, they're connection was destroyed in a hurricane and we need to um, provide relief after a disaster or because they live far enough out that Comcast doesn't want to cover them or whatever. There's a lot of other things that we could do with the technology and so we're exploring all those all of the time. Um, I think that our um, management team would be really mad at me if I uh, blabbed on about them, but there's a lot of other things that are pretty cool that for us to be able to do. Sorry for interrupting. Uh, yes, uh, to that note, um, just a question. What are the current bottlenecks and challenges that you're facing now? Like, is it landing sites? Is it balloon manufacturing? What are the bottlenecks? Yeah, um, I think if our marketing lady was here, she'd be cringing because engineers always see all the warts on everything. Um, so I would say everything is a bottleneck right now because we're always trying to improve everything. Um, when I worked at Tesla, we, we'd always sort of joke, like, it's amazing that any of these cars drive when, in fact, they're, like, totally awesome cars. Um, so with that caveat saying, like, to me, everything has an opportunity for improvement. We're always trying to make our system last longer. So our goal four or five years ago was we want to make a balloon that lasts 100 days. And there were a couple numbers here. We have a lot of balloons that are lasting 100 days and some that are lasting almost 200 days. We're not satisfied with that, right? Because if I can make a balloon last 300 days, then it effectively costs me a third as much to provide that service. And so I can lower the cost, I, my operating cost or the cost that I charge per gigabyte to a customer or whatever. Um, so that, what, that's a huge lever for us is, and it's not just the balloon, it's the whole system, right? Like I need my battery to last longer, I need my flashers on the solar panels to last longer, everything. And so that's a huge thrust for us on the engineering side is like making it last longer. Another bit is we want to have a, a, a wider fire hose of data, right? And so um, in the past what we've done is we use LTE to go from the balloon to your iPhone or whatever. But we actually still have been using Wi-Fi to get the internet to the balloon. Um, that works because it's, it's a point to point. It's not, there's not 1,500 balloons, there's one. And so you get one really reliable connection across 60,000 feet, which is pretty cool if you've ever like walked out the front door and your cell phone or your Wi-Fi drops off your phone. Um, but we want, there's a, there's a new system coming online that I'm not gonna talk about um, that will be way faster than Wi-Fi. And so we effectively just have like way more massive conduit of data to the balloon then the balloon can share it with all the other balloons around it and then down to you. And so you could have 10,000 people with like really fast internet instead of 2,000 people with like medium speed internet, for example. So that, that, that's two things on the technology side. There are certainly others. Like I said, everyone is always working on something. Um, on the 
not technical side, we're figuring out how do we do things like Puerto Rico um, well, right? And so that took us three weeks, but we realized in the, in the wake of that, like, hey, this actually works super well. I probably shouldn't be so surprised. I've been working on it for five years, um, but it worked really well. It also took us, I think, three-ish weeks to get up and running, but we were like, you know, if we plan for that, and if we said, like, hey, it's hurricane season, we should probably just leave a ground station on the island, and someone has to like flip a switch and it's ready and we should talk to the FCC and AT&T and say, if something happens, are you guys cool with this? And we can, we can plan better and be more strategic. That's an example from sort of the, the market space. Um, but suffice it to say, like there's a, a couple hundred people all on Loon all trying to make their piece of it better. Whether it's a mechanical engineer trying to make a thing last longer, an electrical engineer trying to make a thing faster, an RF engineer trying to make his antenna a little more efficient. That way you get faster internet through the roof or, or whatever. So does that answer your question, kind of? OK. Th Thank you for the talk. Yep. W what's the main reason limiting the balloon um, at 180 days uh, lifetime? And the second part is how human intensive is to land the balloon. OK, can you repeat the first question? What's the main reason that's capping the balloon at 180 days? Okay, air? great. So there's actually, there is no main reason that the balloon is capped at 180 days. Um, different parts of the sy system wear differently. Um, the balloon is one huge challenge. Like that, that balloon is famously said, like you're not going to make one that lasts more than 20 days. Um, so the balloon is basically a big giant plastic bag. It's a really fancy, expensive plastic bag, but it's a plastic bag. It ages um, as it rides through the sun. There was, uh, was a little bit in one of the videos about the, the cycling that happens physically from day to night. So when the sun comes up, one, the UV exposure in the stratosphere is really high. Like we're a lot, it's not, the, well, I mean, the 60,000 feet that you're closer to the sun doesn't matter as much as the 60,000 feet of air that you don't have shading the sun between you. And so there's a lot fewer air particles. So the UV just blasts the plastic and ages it a lot more rapidly than it would on the ground. Um, that's one thing. As a mechanical engineer, I can say things that move are really hard to do in the stratosphere. Um, and so if there's like bearings and motors and all that stuff don't work well in the cold. Um, I'm a battery guy, right? And like batteries don't work below freezing. Like you take a lithium ion battery at minus one degree and it's just an ice brick at that point. And so making that work in an environment where it's minus 60 or minus 100 degrees is really challenging. Um, further complicated by the thermal cycling because at night it's really cold and in the daytime if it's painted black it'd be really hot. Um, if you'll indulge me for a moment, I mentioned I really like thermodynamics. Um, and there's three modes of heat transfer. So there's conduction, convection, and radiation. So conduction is I touch this table and it's warm. Convection is there's a, a breeze blowing and I feel cool because I'm shedding heat from my body to the wind as it blows by. And radiation is radiation where it's like there's no like, physical contact at all, even from a uh, uh, gas or air particle. But like black body radiation, like the sun is really hot and so it, it feels hot in the infrared spectrum. Because we're operating at 60,000 feet, there's nothing to conduct to other than inside the systems. So like one battery touching another, a warm battery can warm up a cooler battery, for example. Convection, you know, we can convect to our outside environment. So the air temperature is minus 55 degrees, let's say, Celsius. Space is really cold, like space is like minus 200 degrees Celsius if you look up from the radiation perspective. Normally that doesn't matter that much because the air around you is you know, minus 55 and it would basically keep you railed at minus 55. But because they are so thin, there's not that many air molecules. Um, the reason the balloons look like teardrops is that the air pressure is about 5% um, where we operate, what it is here. So here we have 100,000 Pascal uh, ambient air pressure. There we have about 5,000 Pascal air pressure. Um, that difference makes convection and radiation about equal strength. Um, so normally from conduction to convection to radiation, you drop about an order of magnitude in terms of like the strength or effectiveness of the mode of heat transfer. Because we're in the stratosphere, convection and radiation are essentially about equal. And so for any particular thing I'm trying to keep warm or cold, like I want a warm battery, but I don't want my circuit board to overheat, I have to have a convective and radiative solution for that problem. Um, so we do all kinds of crazy things. Um, if, you, if you know anything about thermodynamics, it's really fun um, mental gymnastics trying to like, not cheat, but like work within the laws of thermodynamics and heat transfer, um, making solutions for things that need to be warm or need to be cold or need to be like in a really narrow range. Um, so that, a lot, those kinds of things end up driving reliability, like I said, for things that move or spin. You know, if I have a bearing, 
that, need, that wants to spin at 20,000 RPM, that, like, once it's spinning 20,000 RPM, it'll keep itself warm. Like, the, just the tiny amount of friction in it, it'll stay warm. But if it starts at minus 100, because it was, like, painted black and facing space, it's just a solid piece of ice, and so I can't even get it going for it to stay warm. So just a, a quick um, diversion, if you will, into, into thermodynamics. You asked me a second question, but I don't remember what it was. To, to land a balloon, how human intensive is it? Okay, so um, not very, actually. So there's a parachute. Um, so we basically say, like, here's our landing site. Like, I want to put it in my backyard, let's say. And so we use all those same algorithms to say, I'm right here. The winds are all doing this. And so we can say, I want to transition to this wind vector here. I might go up or down a little bit, and it's going in the right direction. And then basically we, um, we terminate the flight by opening a small hole in the balloon, and it comes down really slowly. Um, that's all automated. The computer basically predicts, like it puts, you know, kind of X marks the spot in my backyard, if you will. And then at some point, um, I don't actually, I'm not, I don't know when exactly a parachute opens once the air is thick enough for the parachute to grab onto something. And so the balloon's coming down with a hole in the top. You know, it's, it's not like just totally blowing out at gas like you saw in our testing video. Um, but there's a small hole where we're sort of leaking like a party balloon that you take your finger off of. Um, and at some point, a parachute will open and then lower it down gently. There's actually a video, if you want, I can pull it up after, that, that shows that. Um, but they just come floating down really nice. It's really cool to see, actually. Um, very uh, gentle landings most of the time. So from there, a human being needs to go collect it and pick it up. So we have done that different ways. It really depends where you're at. Like in different countries, it looks like different things. In Nevada, we just drive out in an F-150 and toss it in the bed. <laughs> Okay, I think we have time for two more questions. And my question is, say in a natural disaster situation where you don't have any balloons in that particular area of the world, how long does it take you to get up and running with a balloon system, and would you do it by repositioning existing uh, balloons that are somewhere in the world, or would you do it by launching, or depend on the circumstances? That is a great question. So it, the, your, your last statement is the correct one. So it depends on the circumstances. Um, different countries use different LTE spectrum, for example. So we have tried to pick one, the 7 megahertz spectrum, that covers the area that we want to cover. So it's, it's, a, it's a lower speed with a broader beam. Um, but some countries, people like you're like, when you buy an iPhone, you get an AT&T iPhone or a Verizon iPhone, right? Um, or whoever else. Those actually operate on different frequencies, and so we have to pick a frequency that is shared by as much of the globe as possible, but it's not always all of the globe. And so we might be able to go, let's say Columbia had a, a disaster. We, I'm assuming, without checking what AT&T or Telefonica, whoever operates there, we could probably fly the Peruvian balloons up to Columbia and help out like in a day or something. Um, if we needed to go to Africa, it might take us a couple days or a week to cross the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so it really varies. What's not fast is setting up a new launch site. And so when we lost our launch site in Puerto Rico, it was actually borderline miraculous that we were able to get online for just from our R&D test facility, because that one isn't set up to like launch balloons constantly to like put a whole fleet over Puerto Rico. We, you know, we only needed five in place at a given time. Um, but if, we, if our launch site isn't destroyed, we can get anywhere in the world in some number of days. It, it depends where you're at. It depends on the winds. Um, the winds generally move really quick over the oceans and really slowly over land, which works to our advantage. And so um, I don't have any of the videos loaded here, but there, we've done simulations showing in the, the build a band around the, you know, the very southern tip of South America, for example, like balloons just scream across the Pacific and Atlantic oceans, and then they just like totally slow down right where we want them to over Chile or South Africa or, or Australia. Um, we've had, this is an old number, so this is totally out of date, but at one point I was looking to see how fast our balloons were moving and I think a lot of the times they're going like five miles an hour. Remember, we just go however fast the wind is going. And the wind in the stratosphere is really steady, really stratified in different directions of different layers, and really slow. Um, we have had balloons clocked as fast as 100 miles an hour, actually, which is pretty amazing, because that's not turbulent wind. It's laminar flow just blitzing along. I'm, I don't know where that was. It had to have been over an ocean. But all the simulations we run, it, it's, it moves really slowly over land and then just screams across the ocean. So that helps us get where we want to go pretty quickly. OK, so the last question. 
Uh, when will we have Loon for All? Say that again? When will we have Loon for All? So when will we have Loon for All? Uh, I don't know. Um, I th like I said, at one point the, the goal was like, you know, I probably shouldn't say this out loud, like darken the skies, like we want to blanket the globe like a satellite constellation, you know, all the way around. We're not trying to do that anymore. I think we've realized developed countries really don't need us unless there's a, unless there's a huge disaster. Um, we're not the right solution if we wanted to cover the peninsula, like I said. Like we could cover the whole peninsula with a balloon or two, um, but we would all have really slow connectivity if, if we tried. It'd be like having two cell towers, one in San Mateo and one in Mountain View, and telling, if everyone had the range to connect to it, two cell towers just couldn't handle the amount of traffic. Um, that's not to say we're not trying to go a lot of places, um, but the, in terms of the business model and all that stuff, I, I can't really talk about it. I'm sorry. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Yep, thank my you pleasure. again.